I would like to hand over to Olaf to present us the findings of zero carbon supply chains, uh, the case of Hamburg. Olaf. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, and uh, good day to, uh, to all of you. Uh, thanks so much for, uh, for connecting. And happy to share findings of our new report on zero carbon supply chains. Uh, this is, uh, as uh, Michael said, a case study of, of Hamburg, uh, but we think there are also wider implications. Um, so what I'll do is um, give uh, a 10 minute presentation. Um, to, um, have four different uh, different parts. Um, trying to give you the outline of that presentation, uh, the aim and relevance of this uh, report. Um, I'll uh, show some of the initiatives of the stakeholders that we that we looked at. Um, some analysis of the the drivers and obstacles to uh, the zero carbon uh, supply chains. And finally, some policy recommendations uh, that uh, well, are specific to Hamburg, but that uh, also have wider implications also for, uh, for other places. And then, of course, there is a lot of uh, time for questions and, and answers. That is the idea. So I'll start with um, the aim and the relevance of, uh, of this report. Um, freight transport represents around 3 billion of tons of, of CO2 in, uh, in 2020, which is around 9% of total global uh, CO2 emissions. Um, the modes in freight transport are interdependent. Uh, in many cases, there is a chain of different modes, uh, but policies are often fragmented. So that's also why we were interested in looking at this from a holistic perspective. So the aim of this report was to assess the potential, uh, particularly in Hamburg, uh, assess what's already been done, uh, what are the interrelations between the different initiatives of the stakeholders, and the coherence of the measures, and finally also to recommend how supply chains um, could accelerate their decarbonization. <clears throat> so what are the different initiatives that have been undertaken uh, in, in Hamburg itself? We basically looked at uh, six different uh, sorts of stakeholders within the, uh, the, the, the transport chain. We looked at the port authority, uh, the terminal operators, uh, container shipping, hinterland transport, so that is road freight and rail freight, logistic service providers, and, and finally the shippers. So that is uh, the, uh, the companies that actually want to <clears throat> export and, uh, and import. Our report is based on, uh, on interviews uh, with these different stakeholders, and you see what are the the interview for this for this study. <clears throat> then what we also did is, of course, uh, we studied different data and uh, documents that were uh, were relevant for this, and and also provided by uh, by some of the stakeholders. <clears throat> And what we did is for each group of stakeholders, we uh, examined, uh, well, what are actually the carbon emissions of that stakeholder group? <clears throat> what are the reduction targets that uh, have been defined by these organizations? What are the main measures uh, that were put in place to reduce uh, and, uh, and realize these, uh, these targets? And then also what were drivers and obstacles for these, uh, these stakeholders to actually achieve more decarbonization. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to carbon emissions, um, what we noticed is that ports are the nodes, of course, where a lot of the different transport flows come together. So in a way, these are strategic uh, actors that have uh, a lot of impact on the, uh, the decarbonization of uh, freight transport. But their share of the emissions on the whole freight uh, transport chain is actually uh, very limited. So this is an example uh, of uh, the, uh, the uh, transport of a container from inland China to, uh, to Prague using the port of Hamburg uh, as, uh, as the port. And uh, what it shows is that the emissions within the port are, um, are actually very small, around 1%. Most of the emissions actually come from ocean shipping and, and then uh, an important part uh, also from train uh, and the truck uh, transport. When you look at the reduction targets, you see, uh, at least in the, the case of Hamburg, uh, very uh, different targets. Uh, we looked at relative targets, so that is 
uh, let's say the carbon intensity, so the carbon emissions per transported container, for example, and the absolute targets. So that is uh, how how much uh, emissions were, well, well, how much CO2 was emitted uh, by, by these organizations. Um, and what you see is that uh, both the Hamburg port and their container terminals have very ambitious emission reduction targets uh, for the port and, and also for the main terminal operators. This is uh, in line with the, uh, the target of the city of Hamburg, actually, that has a target of carbon neutrality by 2040. This is less the case for other parts of, uh, of the supply chain, for example, uh, the shipping a company based in Hamburg, Hapag Lloyd, uh, for some of the, the road and rail transport operators. What are the main uh, measures that were put in place by these different organizations? Well, I, uh, I put a list here of, uh, of, of different measures. I will not go through most of it, uh, but what is, is, is clear is that a lot of it is based on uh, electrification or using more, uh, more gas. That is uh, the case for, for trucking, for example, um, uh, or hybrids of, uh, of the two. Um, there may be more uh, important and more interesting, the drivers and the obstacles uh, in uh, this push for zero carbon supply chains. Um, we identified four. Um, one is an underused potential of uh, interlinkages. And what we mean by this is that a lot of the stakeholders uh, that we identified are interrelated. Um, so they are either a supplier to the other stakeholder or they are a customer to it. So there are a lot of, let's say, linkages and there's a lot of potential leverage that, uh, that they can have on each other. Uh, but in practice, this uh, is not really the case. So not a lot of the zero carbon supply chain measures are driven by, by this. Uh, carbon emissions are rarely a factor in the choice of shippers when they choose a carrier. Uh, the contracts of carriers with terminals uh, hardly have, have any mention of, uh, of, of carbon emissions. And the same is true for the concession agreements of ports with the, the terminals. So there are interlinkages, but they are underused when it comes to uh, to carbon emissions. A second uh, or an obstacle are the differences in regulatory approaches. Um, for example, when it comes to road freight, a lot of the regulations are aimed, of, uh, aimed at the, the vehicle manufacturers. Uh, and when it comes to shipping, uh, for example, a lot of the regulation is actually uh, focusing on owners and, and operators. Um, and you could also wonder whether the practice uh, within uh, maritime transport of creating regulation with uh, the shipping industry might uh, actually create a lock-in into existing solutions rather than looking for new innovative solutions where a lot of the manufacturers are actually at the core of the debate. A third um, driver and also uh, the moment is that governments do not use the leverage they have over uh, maritime transport and in particular the shipping companies. Uh, in the case of Hamburg, uh, the city state of Hamburg is, is also uh, a stakeholder, shareholder uh, actually of, um, of uh, Hapag Lloyd, the shipping company, uh, but uh, the city state doesn't seem to use that as leverage to actually align Hapag Lloyd also to uh, the uh, climate goals of the city state. Another example is maritime state aid without uh, strings attached. For driver and obstacle, um, more as an obstacle, the common challenge is higher costs of uh, zero carbon uh, transport. Um, if you compare it to existing uh, options, existing fuels. Um, why is that the case? Well, uh, basically because at this point uh, there are fuel and fossil fuel subsidies um, that uh, were both in shipping and for terminals. Um, so that of course makes existing options very, very cheap, but also because a lot of the, uh, what economists call uh, negative external costs. So for example, the costs of existing fuels on, on climate change or emissions are not actually taken into account in the price of uh, alternative of, uh, of the existing fuels, which means that the alternatives are more expensive. 
And that is something that we see uh, in road freight transport, uh, in, in rail, but also in shipping. Well, that leads us to the last part, which is uh, recommendations. Um, we have three recommendations. The first is uh, to have a more proactive strategy uh, at the side of the, the Port Authority. That is not only to focus on own uh, emissions, so the emissions of the Port Authority, but actually also to look at all the different modes that, that use the port. Um, also to actually uh, have a, a long-term strategy with long-term solutions instead of uh, the current strategy, which seems to be really focused on uh, transition fuels. Uh, a large part of the strategy is, uh, is also uh, in place to facilitate uh, uh, options like uh, liquefied natural gas, LNG. But the question of course is what uh, after that and how to stimulate that. One way to stimulate uh, that would be by incentive schemes. Uh, there are already such schemes at the port level, uh, but these are mostly, let's say, discounts for positive behavior. And, and what we recommend is also to have surcharges for, for bad performance, bad environmental performance in this case. Second, second recommendation is a recommendation to the city administration and to be stronger involved in this discussion. Uh, first, to, to use the leverage that they have as a shareholder of, of Apag Lloyd, but also uh, as a port city among other port cities in, in Europe. And we propose uh, that uh, the, the city state of Hamburg initiate a coordination group of port cities uh, in Europe to, uh, to coordinate uh, a policy when it comes to uh, a lot of the decarbonization that could take place in uh, these different ports and port cities. And the third recommendation is, uh, well, the government uh, is uh, to facilitate zero carbon freight. Uh, first of all, by phasing out fossil fuel su subsidies, uh, tax exemptions uh, the, that are there, uh, and that uh, actually uh, stimulate the use of fossil fuels. Um, also to attach green conditions to uh, maritime state aid so to make sure that uh, that the state aid that is there is actually also um, helping the greening the decarbonization of the sector uh, and at the european level to support the inclusion of shipping into the emissions trading scheme at, uh, at the eu level so these were three of the recommendations that were specific to uh, to hamburg uh, and of course uh, these are also a wider uh, implication if you look at, uh, at other ports or port cities um, where ports can play a more proactive strategic role where port cities can also help to uh, to uh, take that uh, that up and and also of course for national governments to uh, to make sure that uh, that this is happening uh, by creating the right incentives I leave it at that uh, for the moment, and uh, I give uh, give back the floor to Michael. I'm of course uh, happy to answer any questions uh, that uh, that you might have. Thank you very much, Olaf, for this uh, short but very rich presentation. Um, this is the moment for for our listeners to um, chime in and uh, put their questions. Into the into the chat. Um, I would like to, if I may, <laughs> that's the privilege I have as the moderator, to kick off with a question that that came to me when I read this. So um, you mentioned these four drivers and obstacles: the missing, uh, the the interlinkages, the role of government, and, and to others. Um, to what extent are they particular, peculiar to Hamburg, specific to Hamburg? Or is this is something which, from your knowledge of ports and what is linked to ports, is happening in a lot of places? I mean, the interlinkages. Is that something which is, you know, uh, being addressed in most ports and Hamburg is standing out or is this something where we can generalize that that's something which can be improved? Yes, I think the case of Hamburg is, is interesting because a lot of the uh, actors are, are probably a little bit more interlinked than in, in some other ports. Uh, so there are, uh, first of all, the city state is, uh, is a main shareholder in a terminal operator. It's also a shareholder in, in a shipping company. Then you have uh, one of the, the Hamburg-based freight forwarders that is also uh, 
a main shareholder in, uh, in the shipping company as well. So there's a lot of, let's say, interlinkages, and, and there's also a strong, let's say, maritime cluster, you could say, in, uh, in, in Hamburg. So what you would expect is that in Hamburg, uh, a lot of, the, let's say, the initiatives would be, uh, would be aligned, uh, which is actually to some extent the case, but, but not fully the case. Uh, and you see that there's different, uh, well, first of all, different different sort of targets, but also some of the measures are not not, not always aligned. So that that shows us that even in the case of Hamburg, where you would expect a lot of alignment, uh, this is not always taking place, and it also remains a challenge. Then, of course, um, yes, this is also something that applies to uh, to many other uh, ports or places, um, because. In a way, the challenge is uh, is the same. You have the same sort of stakeholders, uh, and uh, you would expect uh, that, uh, that there is some sort of a, an interlinkage interlinkage there. And actually, if you look at the recommendations that we uh, that we mentioned for Hamburg, that also applies, I think, to a lot of other places. So that is, ports could play a strategic, proactive role not only in reducing their own emissions, but also the emissions of, uh, of the ships that come to their port, to the trucks, the trains that come to their port, and also to the, the terminal operators that are active in their, in their ports. Uh, the, the port cities in which these ports are located could also have a role um, and, and support the port in this push for, for zero carbon uh, supply chains. They could try to coordinate with other um, port cities to make sure that, uh, that there is some, some sort of a coordination when it comes to, to, to different, uh, different, different policies. Uh, questions are rolling in. Let me, let me throw a few yeah. questions that, that I have. Let me uh, take them one by one. And um, the first one, I think that is quite interesting um, is about the two about fuels. One is other opportunities for ports to switch to green hydrogen as a fuel. And this maybe links to the question of transition fuels. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, obviously, uh, this, uh, this is one of the options that, uh, that a lot of uh, transport companies are looking at. So uh, in this case, in the case of Hamburg, um, we heard it uh, well, a little bit in the in the market. So there were some discussions on uh, on, on trucks. Um, of course, we know also of uh, discussions that exist in, in maritime transport, and and obviously uh, ports as uh, as nodes where all these modes come together um, can have a have a strategic role in, in developing that. Um, of course, the the difficulty is is still that. Uh, Nobody really knows for sure what is going to be uh, the fuel of the of the, of the future. Uh, there might be different pathways. Uh, there might be different sorts of fuels and, and, and options at the same time. Uh, but but obviously this is one of the the possibility that some ports are also looking at and, and also developing strategies for. Um, we haven't seen that in the case of Hamburg. Yeah. The related question to that is whether there, well, what is the current state of art in terms of standardization of fuels, fuels that can be used across modes? Um, is that something that's discussed? Interesting from the supply chain perspective. Well, I think there you have the, the, the issue that not all fuels can in the same form be used in the same, same mode and actually already, uh, I think there's already uh, a difficulty, a challenge when it comes to standardization. Of, of fuels for the same mode, so that is also something that uh, that would needs to be need to be resolved uh, first. Mm -hmm. But obviously, if you look at uh, at ports, uh, then uh, I mean, they can have a role in providing uh, the same sort of fuel for, for road transport, but also for shipping. Mm -hmm. The, the question actually that we that I just asked when when you dropped uh, off was was Lucy's question about uh, recommendations for rail freight operators to port the zero carbonization transition. So in this supply chain, rail plays an important role in the hinterland transport. Um, is there anything in your report on rail? Yes, we actually uh, complement uh, well Hamburg, Germany for its uh, its policies uh, policies there. If you actually look at uh, how much containers are uh, using uh, real uh, then the port of hamburg is one one of the front runners so that is in, in europe uh, this is actually the port where most of the uh, of the, uh, the, the, the highest real mode share uh, from, from ports is, is, is taking place and i think that is based on uh, well a lot of investment in real infrastructure within the port so there's a lot of real there uh, also uh, 
a policy of the port to, uh, to stimulate that, there are actually targets for that, and there are incentive schemes for that. And let's say the, the only thing that we, we could still uh, identify is, let's say, the last mile, well, within ports or within inland ports where uh, there's no electricity, um, so where you need uh, hybrids, and this is also what, what, is, what is taking place at the moment. So you have the shunting locomotives uh, that are more and more hybrids in, in, in the port of Hamburg, and probably in the future also completely uh, well, electric or, or based on alternative fuels. One of the, the specific specificities of, of Hamburg is that it's actually a, a, almost a hinterland port. It's 110 k's uh, down the Elbe or up the Elbe River, um, unlike Rotterdam or Antwerp or, or, or other ports, as Eliakim Ben Hakun points out. And so, does that make easier for Hamburg so this high hinterland connectivity? To, to achieve a low carbon, zero carbon supply chain? Is it a better place than, than others like Rotterdam or Antwerp? Well, in a way, because you, you're closer to, to the hinterland. Um, so that is also an argument that uh, the Port Authority itself uses. Um, but then, of course, uh, one shouldn't generalize, I think, on this, because there's also uh, deep sea ports that can, can develop uh, these, uh, these kind, of, uh, kind of policies. But um, but it's true that uh, here in the case of uh, of, of Hamburg um, there is uh, an immediate hinterland and there's also connections from Hamburg to other parts of of, of Germany of Europe that uh, that help like using the Elbe up to Prague. Um, a question from, from Peter Sitiabudi, um, who points out oh he says he thinks that most of the ports worldwide must together work together. Um, uh, to apply the zero de decarbonization uh, policy. Um, uh, you were asked whether there's any timeline and action plan for post, uh, for, uh, post for port operators to work together. You mentioned this as one of your recommendations to have kind of a, a working group or a, a coordination group uh, of ports. Is that something which is being seriously considered? How would that work? Um, who's interested? Well, I think it is um, starting to emerge as, uh, as something that, that ports are looking at. Uh, but um, at, at the same time, a lot of the port authorities are still in the logic of, uh, of competition. Uh, and of course, when we talk about uh, decarbonization, well, it is clear that ports actually need to, to cooperate with each other and also tr try to remember that they also have a, have a public, uh, public function. Um, so th there is that, but at the same time, we also now see some initiatives of ports to, to actually work together on these, these kind of issues. Um, our recommendation is actually also on, on port cities. So there's a, a lot of cities that have uh, ports, and, and of course, uh, let's say cities have a wider uh, responsibility for also for their, for their, their citizens. So in a way, uh, they could also take a role in trying to push for that, for that coordination. All right. Um, one of the things that struck me uh, in your presentation was uh, the fact you mentioned that uh, emissions do not really factor in the choice of carrier. Um, I wonder why is that? Is that a bit lack of transparency? It's a question of price. Is it a question of lack of alternatives? One would imagine that, you know, in this day and age, uh, that would be something which either through government regulation and incentives or negative incentives, as you mentioned, uh, would be something that carriers would have to take into account if they don't do it voluntarily. Yes, <clears throat> well, I think there's several things. Uh, what, one thing is that uh, indeed a lot of uh, shippers don't really look that much at their, uh, their shipping emissions. So if they look at emissions, they, they look at well their own emissions, they look at maybe also at the, the trucking, um, uh, but they in many cases, the, the shipping they actually uh, tend to tend to forget or to put on second second plan. Then uh, it's true that they also look at many other things, including price, service level. Etc. This is clearly what is what motivates them. Um, 
then it's true, then actually also there isn't that much of a, of a choice. If you, you, you would be interested in, in zero carbon shipping at the moment, it's, it's very difficult. The only thing you could do, there's two carriers that uh, provide, uh, let's say, what, what, what they call uh, zero carbon shipping, but it's actually um, biofuels that are, uh, that are used in, on certain ships. So that is, you can pay a premium, uh, premium and then say, well, that, that is what we, what we did. Uh, and some uh, shippers do that, actually. Uh, we also saw that some of the freight forwarders are actually more active. So some of the freight forwarders uh, acting for some of the large uh, shippers. Let me remind everyone that um, we, we, they're going to see Paul pop up in a, in a minute or so to answer whether they enjoyed this or not. Um, we, we're doing a little longer session today because we had this unfortunate uh, technical issue to give you the opportunity. If you still have questions, type them in now. We we'll try to, to answer them. We'll give, us a, give ourselves another five minutes or so um, if there are questions. And um, I'm looking at a question from uh, Gino Badisare, um, who's asking whether the oligopoly that exists in, in, in shipping is an obstacle uh, for boosting decarbonization strategies because just carriers uh, see the cost is going up and they refuse to do it. What's your view on that? Well, <clears throat> you could say that if you have uh, oligopoly, uh, yeah, you have fewer players. So in, in a way you have, uh, let's say fewer players that would have to go to zero carbon. So if, uh, let's say if the top nine carriers would, would all, all decide then, well, this is the way to go. This is the solution, this is how we do it. Then of course, uh, shipping, at least container shipping would be fairly quickly uh, uh, decarbonized. Uh, I think uh, the question was also hinting at, well, what, what's happening to, to the price of container shipping at the moment, which is, of course, actually a different discussion. Uh, but of course, we have seen uh, more than quadrupling of the, of the container rates. And of course, um, there are different ways to, to look at it. Um, one uh, way is to say, well, of course, in, in this environment of higher prices, um, shippers will be even less interested in uh, well, decarbonization because it's, I mean, already it's too expensive, they think. Uh, so if the price is going to be higher, well, um, they already have difficulties um, tackling this rate. Um, but you could also say, well, actually, this shows that if you quadruple the rates, um, I mean, there's still a lot of shippers that are interested, which means that if you would put in place uh, a carbon price on, on, on shipping, uh, which could have a similar effect, actually, you would still have the, the maritime trade, um, which means that a lot, a lot of the fears that are connected to, to carbon pricing and shipping, that is, it will have a lot of impacts on maritime trade, on certain trade in Asia, et cetera, could actually be be less than uh, than what a lot of people think. Thanks. I see no more questions. I will speak very slowly to give you the opportunity to uh, add one if you have. Um, and I would like to start to conclude by thanking Olaf for having the time to to be with us here, to finding his way back to us after being brutally kicked out by uh, someone somewhere in cyberspace. Um, we talked a lot about uh, ports and shipping. Um, that's probably not wrong because as Olaf showed us, that's 80, shipping is 83% of the carbon footprint along the supply chain. But still we shouldn't forget uh, um, all the other things that happen land side and, and seaside of ports and everywhere throughout. Um, please do download the root report if you haven't already, read it. Um, if questions come up, contact us, contact Olaf, contact me. Um, one of the points of, of this, ask the authors also to interest you in our work and to, to get a discussion going that can go beyond these 30 minutes. Um, we're always open to, to learning from you and to share our knowledge uh, with people outside. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you for asking questions. You will get an email with the link to the recording of this session, um, probably not today, but tomorrow, um, which you can share with colleagues, friends, others who are interested. Um, and we hope to see you again at one of our upcoming Ask the Authors, which will resume in September. 
Uh, we're based in France. France basically shuts down in August, so <laughs> we're taking a little bit of a of a break. But in September, we'll be back. I can tell you already with a number of interesting uh, seminars, webinars that will also revolve very much around the question of decarbonization and uh, low to zero carbon transport. Thank you so much. Uh, hope to see you again. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.